I want to begin today not with the war itself, but talking about the thought of C.S. Lewis. Um, reading for today was from his book, The Abolition of Man, a section of it called Men Without Chests. And Lewis is, in a way, the beginning, if you want to think of his journey, of the second half of the course. Why do I say it that way? Well, because this whole course is really about the decline and then rise of normativity, the loss of faith in values, the loss of faith in standards, of standards of excellence, standards of virtue, advice, standards of right action. People became initially cynical about those and then really gave up on them altogether. By mid-century, they were in a state of some disrepute, at least among those who were intellectuals in society, but especially among those who were affected by the First World War in some way. And it's really beginning with C.S. Lewis and a number of other thinkers in the 1940s that there's an attempt to revive, to breathe new life into the idea of norms, of standards, of concepts of right and wrong, virtue and vice. Now why? Well, we're going to be talking about that much more as we talk about the war. But if World War I was a sort of war that faced people with moral confusion, World War II seemed to people to be a war of moral clarity on the one hand, because we were confronting something that really did seem like an evil ideology. But the other part of it is there were real moral dilemmas that had to be faced. And I think people were aware of those moral dilemmas. It didn't make much sense to simply be cynical about them or say there's no such thing as a right answer or do whatever you feel like. People's lives, in many cases thousands, millions of lives, hung in the balance of those decisions. And so confronted with that kind of decision, in a war that overall seemed morally clear, it was not very easy to say, ah, forget about it, norms are irrelevant. So often pe people in ethics distinguish between the justice of a war in two senses, the justice of going to war, and then the justice of conduct within the war. And as we'll see, in both cases, people felt a hunger for norms. In the first case, feeling that this was a justified war, they wanted some way of justifying that. They wanted to be able to explain why. It looked to people as if they were confronting in various ways and at various times pure evil. And the second thing was, really, within the conduct of the war, there were decisions to be made that really did confront people with moral dilemmas. Well, it was in this context that C.S. Lewis wrote just after the war. He himself was born in Belfast, Northern Ireland. He served in World War I. In fact, arrived at the Somme for the greatest and bloodiest battle of the war on his 19th birthday. But he survived. He became a fellow and tutor at Magdalen College, Oxford, and later at Cambridge University. And you see him here. He ended up writing not only a lot of academic things, but a lot of popular works. During the war itself, he gave a variety of talks on the radio uh, to try to keep British spirits up and explain Christian values to them. He became a significant Christian apologist, writing works like Mere Christianity, and also writing The Chronicles of Narnia and a variety of other fictional works. He himself described his work as revolving around two themes. First, that human beings all over the earth have this curious idea that they ought to behave in a certain way. So in other words, he's saying, look, we all have ideas of right and wrong, of virtue and vice. We all have norms built into us in some way or at least almost all of us do, anybody who is not a deviant, a sociopath of some kind, has some conception of moral values. And they really can't get rid of it. It is what it is to be human, to have this kind of inner compass, this moral sense. Secondly, they don't in fact behave in that way. That is to say, we don't always live up to what our conscience directs. So we're imperfect people. We have an idea of right and wrong. It's just that we often fail to live up to it. And he thinks of these as more or less universal. They are features of human nature. He says, people know the law of nature, they break it. These two facts are the foundation of all clear thinking about ourselves and the universe we live in. So somebody like Shaw, who casts a sort of uh, cynical eye toward values. Somebody like Nietzsche, who tosses all traditional values out and says we have to start anew. Lewis is saying, no, that's ridiculous. We all are built with this sense of a sort of moral structure of the universe. He refers to it in the evolution of man as the Tao, borrowing a concept from Eastern philosophy. In Confucius, the Tao just means the path, the way, the right way to live. And it's that sort of Tao that he's referring to. We all have some awareness that certain things are right, other things are wrong. And it's something that is, in a certain sense, basic to us. If it's a complicated issue, yeah, we may have to do a lot of moral thinking. But a lot of basic things are really fundamental. 
We don't have to think a lot about it. We have an intrinsic sort of reaction. If I were, for example, to bring, gosh, this is horrible because I love cats, but suppose I were to bring a cat into the front of the room here, and I were to just start kicking it around, and then I were to set it on fire. You would all, immediately, I would hope, have a, a horrible, <laughs> a reaction to that is a horrible thing to have done, right? You would all immediately sense a violation of the now. Or suppose I were to do what ancient <laughs> Zen Buddhist monks did, and as a way of instructing you, brought in a large stick and would beat you with it if you gave inappropriate answers. Okay? Or if you asked the wrong question. <laughs> I heard the story of Master Yishuan, Master Rinzai, he was known, also one of the fat well, a founder, maybe the founder of Zen Buddhism, who used to react this way. If you asked him, Master, what is the basic idea of the law preached by the Buddha? He would beat you with this large stick. Okay? Well, suppose I were to do that. I were to ask a question, and somebody says, I don't understand what Buddha said about it. What? Can you explain it? I go over and start attacking you. You know, there's something wrong with this. This is not the right way to do things. And so he says, look, we all have this essential knowledge of this, but we also realize people don't give up. People have this idea, and when they do wrong, they typically know that they are doing wrong. Lewis is an advocate of what is known as natural law theory. That is to say, he thinks morality is objective. There is an objective truth about what is right, what is wrong, what is virtuous, what is vicious. Those norms that are objective, he sees as following from nature, following from the nature of the world and from human nature. So it is part of the nature of the universe and part of our nature that we react negatively to certain things and positively to certain others. It is not, in other words, just something that is purely subjective in us. It's not a matter of taste. It's not something that really varies significantly from person to person. It is something that is really part of the order of the universe. And you might say those norms that are rooted in nature, including human nature, are things that have an objectivity because they are shared, because they really do stem from the structure of humanity and from the structure of the world. So what's wrong with, for example, kicking around that cat and setting it on fire? Well, it somehow violates the structure of human nature and it violates the structure of the world. It's something that goes against very, very basic principles. And similarly, to hit students for asking questions, that too, right, is somehow a violation of things. It's, it's not just that it violates social norms or that in the 21st century I could get punished and thrown out for doing that kind of thing, whereas in the 9th century people were willing to accept it. It's instead something that we would recognize as an affront to human dignity itself. Now, here are his main enemies. One of them, which was a popular view by this time, before the war, was what we now call non-cognitivism. At the time, it was called emotivism. And the idea of it is that normative statements, statements about what ought to be the case, what's good, what's bad, what's right, what's wrong, just, unjust, virtuous, vicious, all of that is really something that is not objective. In fact, it is not really apt for truth at all. Moral statements like that can't be true. They can't be false. They are really expressions of an emotion. And so to say murder is wrong, that's something like saying murder? Ooh. Okay? Or generosity is a virtue? That's like saying generosity! Yeah! Okay? Now, there are all sorts of things that are like that, right? Where we do just express emotion. We don't really... I mean, you're in a football game, and you start shouting, Texas! You're not really a survivor, right? <laughs> Good. You're not exactly, you're not asserting anything, right? That's not the kind of claim that can be true or false. It's not like somebody can, you know, Texas, fight! Somebody says, oh, that's not true. <laughs> Some of our games <laughs> might tempt you to think that. But actually, no, it's not, I mean, it's an exhortation. It's not something that can be true or false. And we can often express emotion. People cheer. Something good happens on the football field, and people are shouting, yes. You know? And other things that are, are bad, and maybe they boo, maybe they just go, oh, do And those are expressions of emotion. They're not true or false. So according to this view, that's what moral statements are like. They're really just expressions of emotion. They aren't true or false. They're boo or hooray for certain things. Yeah? If you're a non-cognitivist, then it's not objective at all, any more than cheering for the Longhorns reflects some kind of objective truth. 
Um, it's not even the kind of thing that could be objective, right? It's just an expression of emotion. Um, so what are some other moral claims? Well, actually, I mentioned, you know, setting a cat on fire would be wrong. That's like setting cats on fire? Boo! Or more like, oh, you know, that kind of thing. Or, uh, gosh, say, you know, hitting students with sticks. You'd be like, sad face, right? <laughs> and really, it's like you could express this with emoticons. Hitting students, no? Sad face. <laughs> that's sort of what it amounts to. And that's all that moral judgment's about to. And so, the non-cognitive is just as it's all boo and yay for various things. Now, subjectivism is closely related, but not exactly the same thing. According to the subjectivist, and this is really his main target, and again, in mid-century there were plenty of people who were subjectivists, the idea is that normative statements could be true or false, but they describe attitudes. They don't just express attitudes like yay or boo, but they do describe them. And so here's the way Lewis puts it in the, in the words of Gaius and Titus, his two uh, opponents here. We appear to be saying something very important about something, and actually we're only saying something about our own feelings. That's what his enemies here are saying. So murder is wrong in this view is I, or maybe we, disapprove of murder. Um, generosity is a virtue. That's something like I, or we, approve of generosity. You've heard of you very much like this before. Where have we encountered it in this course? Yeah, in Hume, right? At the very beginning. And Hume was saying, so I describes murder is wrong, for example, what am I really saying? That I respond to it with a feeling of disapproval. And so I describe something as virtuous, vicious, what am I really saying? According to Hume, it's simply that a humble feeling of approbation or disapprobation in my breast. Okay, that's all it comes down to. It's a question of, I approve, I disapprove. Now that's something that could be true or false. I could say I approve of something when in fact I don't. Maybe a lot of people are putting pressure on me to go along with the crowd on some issue. And even though I disagree, I say, okay, I approve. So I could lie about that. I could be wrong. This is something that could be true or false. Nevertheless, it's not in a very interesting way. I'm just describing my own feelings. So hitting students, I just, I just approve of that. Now, notice, there's a sense in which you and I can't really disagree about this. If you say, I think it would be a good idea to start hitting students, <laughs> well, gosh, then there's a disagreement in a way, but not really according to the subjectivist, because you're saying you approve of it, and I'm saying I disagree. Okay? And both of those things can be true. So, it's something like somebody saying, I don't know, go, oh, you, and somebody else saying, oh, you sucks. <laughs> Well, I guess OU sucks is sort of claim, isn't it? <laughs> no, I don't know what kind of claim it is. But anyway, uh, you know, that sort of, ooh, yay, in a sense we're disagreeing, but not really. There can't be any actual factual disagreement between us. There isn't any claim that I think is true and that you think is false. And the same thing here. I approve, you say I disapprove. We can both be right. It's hard to locate disagreement. Now, here is more deeply what Lewis sees as wrong with this view. He's arguing for it in a number of ways here. And one of them is that he says, look, I think they misunderstand the nature of what education and what moral education specifically are all about. He says, Gaius and Titus, these two, uh, these two theorists he's arguing against, may have honestly misunderstood the pressing educational need of the moment. They see the world around them as swayed by emotional propaganda, looking, for example, at the rise of Hitler. They've learned from tradition that youth is sentimental. They conclude that the best thing they can do is fortify the minds of young people against emotion. So notice they're doing this, not as a way of saying, yes, so boldly express your emotions. <laughs> Instead, rather, they're saying, look, in the end, it's just an expression of emotion, and be suspicious of emotion. Now, this idea gets expressed in various ways even today. For example, there are questions on exams that you all will probably take where you're asked to read some passage and then talk about what is fact and what is opinion. Now, among the things that are listed as opinion there is anything that's of absolute. So if somebody is describing a murder, for example, and then says that that was wrong, the right answer is supposed to be, and that was wrong, was the opinion part. And it's that kind of thing that is driving Lewis crazy. Saying, what do you mean, that's just an opinion? Is it just an opinion? Just an expression of approval or disapproval? Just a, a matter of taste that murder is wrong? 
Are you really just saying, look, here are the facts that person murdered this other person? Oh, and by the way, you know what? I, I don't like that very much. I mean, kind of murder, boo. I it's true. <laughs> you say, no, come on, look. It is just as much true of the world that murder is wrong as it is true that that person committed the murder. And so the idea that that's merely opinion or merely a description of my feelings or merely an expression of emotion or some other kind of attitude is wrong-headed. No, it's really a truth about the world. And in fact, he says, here's really what's going on. My experience as a teacher, he says, tells the opposite tale. For every one pupil who needs to be guarded against us and the weekends that excess of sensibility, there are three who need to be awakened from the slumber of cold vulgarity. The task of the modern educator is not to cut out jungles, but to irrigate deserts. The right defense against false sentiments is to inculcate just sentiments. So here's his idea. Really, it's not just that emotion can mislead us. It's a guard of people against emotion. And by the way, all these normative things, all these ethical claims, they're just expressions of emotion, or they're just descriptions of emotion. He's saying, no, look, what it is to become a moral person is to develop the right kinds of emotions. You have this sense built into you of the now, of what the fundamental moral structure of the universe is, but it's something that can be squashed and hidden, or it's something that can be developed. You've got to develop it and you've got to inculcate the right kinds of emotion. That's what education is all about. And so he says, here's the idea, really. Until quite modern times, all teachers, and even all men, believed the universe to be such that certain emotional reactions on our part could be either congruous or incongruous to it. Believed, in fact, that objects didn't merely receive, but could merit our approval and disapproval, our reverence or our contempt. So the idea is that when I say something's wrong, I'm not describing my own reaction to it, or even our social reaction to it. I'm saying it's worthy of disapproval. I'm not saying I disapprove. I'm not merely expressing my disapproval by saying, Ooh. no, I'm saying it's worth disapproving. There's something wrong with it. And so I'm making a claim, a claim that could be true or false. Now, what do we mean it could be worthy of disapproval? Well, here is basically his reconstruction. Murder is wrong. Roughly, that means something like, we should disapprove of murder. In other words, that's already a normative claim, and to unpack it would need a norm, like, we should disapprove. It's worthy of disapproval. It merits disapproval. It's the kind of thing we ought to disapprove of. Now, implicit in this, and really explicit in its justification for it, is the thought that emotions can be congruous or incongruous. They can be appropriate or inappropriate. They themselves can be right or wrong, and we can say you ought to react to this with a certain kind of emotion. Suppose you see a brutal murder, and you're actually going to say, ha, ho, whoa, dude. That's not the right way to respond. Suppose I were to light this cat on fire, and your reaction is to say, oh, can I light it on fire too? That's not the right kind of emotional reaction. Suppose you see an act of generosity. You see somebody helping out somebody in need. You're supposed to approve of that. If your reaction is to say, go over to the person who's just been, let's say, given the handout, kick him in the face and take the money, and say, ha, ah, that's inappropriate. Think about that kid in The Simpsons, um, Nelson Muntz, isn't it? Who is constantly going around saying, ha, ah, ha. Ah. Okay? He's a good example of inappropriate emotion. Almost always, he's responding the way you're not supposed to respond to that. He sees somebody suffering, and he goes, ah, ah. And that's not the way you're supposed to react. Or suppose, I mean, somebody, yeah, suppose somebody trips and stumbles and falls down the stairs here. If, you might laugh if they're not, right? But suppose they fall down and they break their arm. What if you laugh? Ha! Ah, that's so funny. Well, you're broken. <laughs> you're not supposed to react that way emotionally. Now, you might approve. You might say, oh, that was really funny, dude. Um, that's not the way you're supposed to react. And so we can judge whether emotions are appropriate or inappropriate. And he finds various historical models for this. He says, Augustine defines virtue as ordo amoris, the order of love, the inordinate condition of the affections in which every object is accorded the kind of degree of love which is appropriate to it. And so you might think, that's the idea. We're supposed to have our emotions reacting to things in the world and appropriate to the structure of the world and the human nature. If we start having emotional reactions that are very different from that, there's something wrong with those emotional reactions. And according to the subjectivist, all I can do is describe my emotional reactions. So if I just say, hey, I approve of people breaking their arm, 
Yeah, there's nothing more to say. Yeah, right. I do. What I'm saying is true. Let's say in that scenario. And yet, you could say, hey, look, there's something wrong with that. You're not supposed to approve. It does not merit approval. And so, don't cheer for that. Don't say you approve of that. That's already to indicate there's something wrong with you. Aristotle says the aim of education is to make the pupil like and dislike what he ought. And so you might say, here's part of what you do in being brought up in the right sort of way. You're taught to like certain things and dislike certain things. The basic tendency toward that is already built into you. You have this innate conscience or this innate awareness of this moral structure of the universe, but it's something that needs to be nurtured, developed, encouraged. And so that's part of what it's all about, getting you to react in the right kinds of ways. But that whole question of trying to get you to feel what you ought to feel, that doesn't even make any sense from a subjectivist point of view or a non-cognitivist point of view. Now, the point of this type, men without chests, what does he mean? We were told us long ago by Plato that as the king governs by his executive, so reason in man must rule the mere appetites by means of the spirit and element. The head rules the belly through the chest. And here is the idea in Plato. Plato, we've talked about this a little bit, divides the soul into three parts. There is reason, the rational element, which thinks. There is the spirited element, the emotion, the emotion, which feels. And then there's the appended element, desire, which wants. And the whole idea is that reason has to be in charge. But how does it exert this control? Reason doesn't seem to be particularly powerful against emotion and against desires. And so how can it do it? Well, the answer is that the spirited element should at least go along with reason. Reason recruits the spirited element. It recruits emotion, feelings, to help it along. And so in the ideally rational person, in the ideally virtuous person, and he thinks in the ideally happy person, emotion and reason go together. They are allies. Now, they can come into conflict, but in the best scenario, the rational element and the spirited element go together. I think about things a certain way, and I feel about them in a way that's appropriate to how I think about them. <coughs> he compares the soul to a chariot, and he says, think about a chariot driven by two horses. One of these horses is well-behaved and commands, uh, and accepts the commands of the driver. The other horse is really badly behaved and fights against the driver, and then the driver is trying to control things. His ally is that good horse, but then the unruly horse, that's difficult to control. The idea is supposed to be that reason is like the driver of the chariot. It by itself can't propel the chariot, but these two horses can. One is emotion, and at least in the well-functioning soul, emotion is working together with the driver. It's the one that accepts the commands of the driver. On the other hand, desire, that's the one that is harder to control. That really is responding to things that have nothing to do with reason, and so is responding to things the driver doesn't care about, and so the driver has to work to control that horse, but can use emotion as a guide. And so here's the little picture. Yeah, we've got reason there in the chariot. The noble, well-behaved horse is emotion, and then desire is the other horse that is much harder to control. Now, we might say that Lewis is introducing here something I'll call the paradox of subjectivism. The subjectivist does approve of and recommends certain virtues, but he says, look, the subjectivist actually has a position that undercuts those virtues. If you're a subjectivist, what's the point of developing virtues? What's the point of actually developing in yourself the right kinds of emotional responses or, for that matter, the right kinds of actions? There isn't any point. After all, it's just a question of what you subjectively approve and disapprove. And here's how he puts it. And this is a very famous quote, by the way. And all the time, such as the tragic comedy of our situation, we continue to clamor for those very qualities we're rendering impossible. So he says, you can hardly open a periodical, a periodical without coming across a statement like this. We need more drive, more dynamism, more self-sacrifice, more creativity, more whatever it is. And he says, but look, if you really think in the end, all of this is a matter of taste, a question of just what you have to approve of or disapprove of, then why should anybody do that? He says, in a sort of ghastly simplicity, we remove the organ and demand the function. We make men without chests and expect of them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and build, bid the geldings be fruitful. And so in the end, we undermine the very possibility of virtue. Now, what exactly is the argument here? 
I think there is a powerful argument. Sometimes Lewis is such a good writer that it's actually hard to tell what the argument is. But it's, here's part of it. Suppose that it really is just a match of what I approve and disapprove. That is to say, when I say something's wrong, I'm really just saying I'm disapproving of it. If I say something's right, I say I approve of it. I call something a virtue, I just mean I approve. Well, why should that motivate anybody else? Okay? It offers no reason to do the right thing or to seek virtue. That I approve of something gives you no reason to do anything, right? I mean, I approve of generosity. Why isn't that just like I approve of the Pittsburgh Steelers? <laughs> or I like mushrooms. Does that give you reason to do anything? I mean, I'm a fan of the Pittsburgh Steelers. So what does that mean for you? Nothing at all. <laughs> it implies nothing about what you want to do with respect to football or anything else. Suppose I say, I like mushrooms. What does that imply about you? Should you go out and eat mushrooms because I like them? No, right? There's no motivating character to that at all. So I say, I approve of generosity. I approve of kindness. I approve of wisdom. You say, so what? Right? Maybe you don't like mushrooms. Maybe you don't, don't like the Steelers. Maybe you don't like generosity. Okay, there's nothing much more to be said. It's all in the end a matter of taste. And so this kind of thing can't motivate anyone at all. So what's the point of saying, ah, people should be more creative, for example, if in the end that's just a way of saying, hey, I like creativity. You can say, eh, I don't know. And there's nothing more to be said. So for example, I, I went a little silly here. But suppose I said, I really like clothing with cats on it. OK, I'm fond of cats. Maybe I'm fond of cat clothing. I have no idea when you Google this how many things come up. But there are, for example, cat sweaters. <laughs> like that. Cat sweatshirts, cat shirts. There are cat jackets. There are cat skirts. There are cat stockings. <laughs> there are cat dresses. Oh, and more cat dresses. <laughs> there are cat wedding dresses. Now, <laughs> why should this motivate anyone, right? Are you inspired to go out and get clothing with cats on it? No. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, in general, you might think, no. I mean, look at the model on the left. She's looking down. It's like, I hope nobody recognizes me. Look at the one on the right. She's like, are you serious? <laughs> I have to wear this. Or look at her. She's. I mean, she's carrying some sort of chain. She looks like she's about to strangle the photographer, right? <laughs> and so the fact that somebody likes this doesn't mean you have to like it or anything. Now, it's actually worse than that. It's not just that it doesn't motivate. It actually undercuts virtue in the following way. It implies that virtue and vice are really just matters of taste. But here's the thing. Developing our moral sense, <coughs> developing virtue, trying to abide by criteria of right action, all of that is hard. It requires hard work. It requires thought. It requires sacrifice. It requires self-sacrifice in a lot of cases. It requires attention. It requires, well, delayed gratification. I mean, quick question quiz. Take a two-year-old. How can you tell whether that two-year-old will succeed at life? Here's the simplest possible test that psychologists have worked on. And it correlates with all sorts of things later. Give them a marshmallow. And assuming the kid likes marshmallows anyway, and say, now, I'll give you another one in 10 minutes if you don't eat this one. If you still have it 10 minutes later, I'll give you a second marshmallow. Can the kid wait 10 minutes or not? The children who can't tend to do poorly academically and tend to have very low incomes throughout life. The kids who can wait tend to do well academically and do well in life. And it's like, whoa. <laughs> now, some of that suggests this is part of our you know, tendencies. But this is something also that can be developed. You can learn to delay gratification. You can learn to work hard for goals. However, you might say, look, what incentive do I have to do any of that if it's just a matter of taste? I say I like mushrooms. You don't think, well, I better get hard to work to develop a taste for mushrooms then. I mean, what, what sense would that make? And so similarly, I say, I admire creativity. Are you going to yeah, go out there and be inspired to try to become creative? I say, I really admire hard work, careful argumentation, and so on. You're going to say, ooh, I better do that. Instead, you might just say, well, I don't. Tough luck, man. <laughs> so not only does it not give you an incentive, you might say, by suggesting it's a matter of taste, it really undercuts any motivation you could have to develop this kind of thing. Well, as I mentioned, I think that Lewis is motivated 
And many thinkers start being motivated around this time to say, there must be more to norms than we thought. We thought that if we got rid of normativity, we'd be getting rid of people's reasons for living for certain things, for dying for certain things, for killing for certain things. And so surely a world without norms would be like that world John Lennon imagines where everybody lives together in peace and harmony. But it became clear by the 1940s that was not true. And so people started thinking, wait a minute, maybe we needed those conceptions of right and wrong, justice and injustice, good and evil. 